Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with a Scientist. I'm Leia with Headwater Science Institute, and today I'm really pleased to get to introduce you to Spencer Usden, our program director. Uh, he's been a wonderful asset to Headwaters. He develops our programs, he works with students, and he's currently teaching our online student research program. He studied environmental science and biology, and he's gonna tell you about one of his projects today on whether climate change impacts butterfly migration. So in a minute, you'll get to see some of his really, really cool research and his field work with some amazing butterflies. Before we jump into that, I just wanted to um, do a couple housekeeping things. So we are screening the film Picture a Scientist this week. It's the 5th through the 7th this Thursday through Saturday. And today is the last day to register for your free ticket. So all you have to do is sign up with your email and we'll send you a link to watch the movie for free. It's a community service that we are sponsoring for you because we really think that people should be talking about equity in science. So if you're interested in the film, please feel free to register. I'll put the link to register in the comments below. It's a short link, bit.ly slash HSI dash science film and I will put that below. So we're gonna move on and we're gonna welcome Spencer Houston. Hey Spencer, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm good. You know, it's funny, usually it's a, it's a brand new face, but you and I work together all the time, so this is a special treat. I know, and I'm kind of excited to share a little bit of a, it's kind of a, a little pet research project and science um, experiments I've done that's not really related to headwaters that I don't get to share with a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. So we get to see a whole nother side of you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll turn it over to you and here we go. Perfect. Um, so the, the title of my talk today is, is climate changing, uh, climate change affecting butterfly migration? Um, and one of the, the neat things about this is, is this talk is a little bit different um, from some of the other talks you might see. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about the details about what makes this project that I'm working on as part of here a little bit different. But before we do that, I just wanted to, to go over a little bit um, about butterflies and, and why we care about them. Um, and so with that, um, one of the neat things is, is butterflies can migrate. Um, not all butterflies, but some of them. And here we've got some pictures of the, the monarch butterfly, which many of you are familiar with, um, that do these really cool migrations um, across Northern America. Um, and kind of why do butterflies migrate? And so butterflies tend to migrate because they're these insects that are they're really small and they can be affected by temperature. And so sometimes when it's, it's warmer or colder in one place, they'll move to a place that's more favorable. Um, the other thing is that butterflies and their, their larval caterpillars eat a lot. Um, caterpillars can eat a huge amount of vegetation. And let's say some places in the tropics where it might be great for butterflies to live year round, there might not be enough food for these butterflies to live there all the time. And so part of their migration is not just um, finding better weather, it's also finding places where um, there's lots of food for their caterpillars um, to eat and develop um, and lay their eggs. When they migrate, um, there's some key things that go on here. They, they use plant nectar for food. Plant nectar has a lot of carbohydrates and sugars in it. And so that's kind of what powers these butterflies on these um, sometimes really long or, or sometimes shorter migrations that they do. And along the way, the, the food and nectar that they get from flowers is what powers these migrations. Um, and in addition to, to eating the, the nectar from flowers, um, these butterflies pollinate along the way by going and eating the nectar from the different flowers, they move pollen from flower to flower and pollinate tons and tons of plants along the way. Um, while butterflies aren't the only poll uh, pollinators, they're some of the most well-known ones and pollinators really affect all of us really um, quite a lot in a positive way. Um, some people, uh, economists estimate that the value um, of insect pollination in terms of dollars um, benefits humans between 200 and 500 billion dollars a year just in terms of all the times when insects move from flower to flower pollinating helping crops apples um, are a great example of this grow across the world 
And so these types of pollinators are hugely important to us. And so a little bit more about butterfly migration here. Um, and so here's a map that you may have seen before. It's from this great organization, monarchwatch.org. Um, and it shows you the, um, the monarch butterflies. And I just wanted to highlight these ones here um, because monarchs are kind of special. They're the only type of butterfly that uh, migrates um, twice a year, two-way migration. All the other butterflies tend to only migrate once um, in, in their adult stage. They'll kind of migrate somewhere, they'll lay their eggs, their caterpillars will um, eat a bunch of plants, then they'll go into this great metamorphosis with a, a chrysalis, they'll hatch out as an adult, and then the adult might migrate to a different place. Um, but monarchs do this really cool um, back and forth migration with the spring and fall. Um, but a lot of other uh, butterflies tend to just migrate one way, and there's some butterflies that stay, stay put. Um, and so now that we know a little bit more about butterflies, um, I want to talk about kind of this problem of climate change and why it might be relevant to butterflies. So I know there's a lot going on here, um, but what I want to do is just call your attention to the, the map of the United States on the left. And you see the different color codes there. If you're a gardener, you might recognize these zones a little bit. So these are what we call hardiness zones. Um, it's kind of a, a map of what different types will, of plants will grow where. So generally the darker and more purple ones tend to correspond to colder areas. And the, the orangey and yellow colors are um, warmer plants. And so if you want to know what type of plant that might grow well where you live, um, you can look up the hardiness zone where, um, where you live and then buy a plant that we know will grow and thrive in that hardiness zone. Um, and so one of the, the interesting things is people, because um, we have a long history of farming and food production going back sometimes hundreds of years, um, have been tracking where the hardiness zones historically are across the country. And we can see with climate change and greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions that where the hardiness zones of these different plants are is changing. Um, it's not a, not a huge, huge change, but in just 20 years, we can see on this map, um, these purple zones up here have mostly gone from the United States. Um, and then filling in their place is some of this lighter purple and things are kind of generally shifting northward. Um, and so if you're a plant, that kind of impacts how you can live and, and what you're going to do. And so we also see this when we look at plants. Sometimes plants that normally live in a certain area are being found in a more north, typically colder area than they historically have. And so if we can think about how this might affect butterflies, um, remember back that nectar is food for all of these butterflies. And so if we start getting different flowers in different areas, that can affect them along the migration. The other really interesting thing that we're going to talk about today um, is this word phenology. Um, you may or may not have heard this before in science class, but phenology is basically the timing of the development of the reproductive stage. And so basically you can think of it as what time of year do flowers bloom or what time of year do their first flower buds come out or what time of year do they make seeds? And the interesting thing is flowers tend to only make nectar during certain parts of the year, during certain parts of their reproductive cycle when they want their pollen to be spread from one place to another. And so if we can see with this climate change and different flowers in different places, or another thing with climate change is that our, war our winters are getting a little bit warmer um, and our summers are also getting warmer. And so sometimes flowers that would typically flower in the summer are flowering earlier in the year, um, sometimes more in the spring. And that timing is the really the big thing that we're trying to get at um, with this question here. Let's see. Um, and so the, the research question um, 
that we're trying to look at is kind of a, an interesting one. And we're looking at places in a really big area. And so this is kind of gets to the unique part of this experiment that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so how do we study firefly or butterflies across this really big area? That's a really expensive thing to do scientifically to kind of look at these butterflies that live sometimes in the year in Mexico and other times in California, Montana, Arizona, Nevada. Um, so how, how we do this um, is often through this neat volunteer network called Citizen Science. And so one of the different things about this presentation was I actually didn't design this research project like many of the other talks you've seen on this channel before. It's actually designed um, by these scientists at the University of Arizona um, in their entomology or insect studying department. And they worked with this group called Adventure Scientists, who is a really cool nonprofit that I'll tell you a little bit more. But what they tend to do is they match people who like to go outside and are willing to collect data with scientists who need data. Um, and we do this thing called citizen science where citizens just like you and I or, or any of you go out and volunteer to collect data. And we share this data with scientists that allows scientists to collect data far more broadly um, than they might otherwise be able to do. Um, so with that, the kind of general research question that we're looking at um, in this project is, is climate change causing the timing of butterfly migration and flower blooms to be decoupled? And so historically, butterflies will migrate at the same time that the flowers will bloom, so they have this nectar to eat along the way. But as climate change is, is changing things in ways we've never seen before, um, are the flowers and the butterfly migration happening at the same time? Or are they at different times? And if so, um, what's going on? And we kind of have this general hypothesis that kind of warming in these northern climates might cause flowers to bloom earlier and then the butterflies um, might arrive when the flowers aren't there. And that could be a problem, but we wanted to collect data to try and figure this out. Um, and that's where I came in. I came and helped this um, group collect data. And, and one of the interesting and unique things about this um, was we know a lot about butterflies in urban areas where there are a lot of people, um, but those urban areas tend to be more heavily impacted by, by people and there's more, um, I guess, uh, gardening and flowers that might not be there naturally. But we, the study really wanted to find out um, what is happening to butterflies in wilderness areas. And so um, some of you who may not know me from Headwaters also um, might be interesting to know, I, I like to go outside and do a lot of things outdoors. And, and one of them is trail running. And this study wanted to find people who could run for, for many miles um, out into these wilderness areas really far from other people and then collect data on the butterflies there. So this is the map of, of my commute when I was butterfly sign, um, collecting butterflies. So some of you familiar with the Tahoe area, you might be able to see on the far right, we kind of started by the Five Lakes Trail um, by the Alpine Meadow Ski Resort. And then we ran west, um, southwest, um, way out into this wilderness area called the Granite Chief. It was about eight miles um, on trail till we got to the location where I was studying butterflies. Um, I had this, this net that I kind of folded up and strapped to my backpack um, and kind of ran out there to this place and we didn't see a lot of people, um, but we did see a lot of butterflies. Um, and so here's how we, we did our data collection and, and what that involved. Um, perfect, so kind of our, our materials and methods, like we said, we, we hiked out to the field site and that typically took kind of three, two to three hours, um, depending on how fast we wanted to go that day. And we started by spending 30 minutes counting the plants um, in their phenophase. And I'll tell you what the phenophase is, it's, it's just a moment, but it's kind of what type of, of stage these plants are from flowering to making seeds. And then every time we spent an hour catching butterflies and photo photographing them. So we'd, we'd take them and if you can see on the left, we would catch these butterflies with this net in the middle, um, and then we would kind of hold them really carefully and spread their wings apart with tweezers. Um, and that was the scariest part of this whole thing, um, was working with these really fragile butterflies. 
and take photos of them. Um, and part of the reason we are studying butterflies is that their identification based on their pattern is pretty relatively easy compared to things like honeybees or flies or other pollinators. And so we could take a photo just with our, our cell phone camera um, and then share it with these scientists and they could ID the, the butterflies and help us go to that. And then we repeat it at a couple different field sites um, and I do this three times of summer. And then I wasn't the only one doing this. There are probably 20 or 30 other people in California doing this in other wilderness locations. And then a bunch of people doing this in other states across the American West. And all of us kind of teamed up here to, to do this. Um, and our equipment was pretty simple. We just had a butterfly net, um, tweezers, and then we used this um, app called iNaturalist, which is really neat. Any of you can log on to iNaturalist and upload pictures of cool nature things you see. Um, and other people can identify them. And you can also go on to iNaturalist and look at an area and see what other people have seen around um, where you live. So it's a really neat way to figure out the types of things around there. Um, and so the first time we went out, we got all our stuff and we, we got there and we were ready to collect data. Um, and I guess kind of one of the things we realized pretty quickly um, is that butter catching butterflies is really hard. So I've got a video of one of my good friends, Johannes, who um, joined me for data collection one day. Um, and he's trying to catch a butterflies. And butterflies are really well evolved to um, avoid getting eaten. And their primary predators are birds who are really fast, much faster than us. Um, and as you can see, catching butterflies um, is not easy. You kind of wait, and then you try and run around with this net, and you're chasing after this butterfly on this really rocky slope, trying not to trip and fall. And, and most of the time, um, the butterfly tends to get away. Um, we kind of made a joke that we had to try to catch butterflies 10 times before we'd actually catch a single butterfly. And so that was one thing that was interesting to me is how good butterflies are at avoiding being caught. Um, and so that was kind of one of the, the neat things about this research um, and one of the hard things. Um, and so in each place, we also had to calculate or measure the plant data. So we talked about phenology earlier. Um, and here's a great diagram that explains it. We kind of took these pictures of these flowers that were growing in this place. Um, and we kind of saw the buds um, to the, the flowers. And the flowers were when we were really seeing most butterflies. And then afterwards, we could see these fruits and seeds. And we use all these things to, to do this. And one of the, the neat things was we could see the cycle of different flowers throughout the summer. Um, because we go back to the same time, same place, um, multiple times a summer for multiple years, I could see that um, this type of flower was first, and then this other one. And then there were a whole bunch of flowers kind of in the middle. And then there were a few at the end. And getting to know when the different flowers came through um, was a, a pretty neat part of this experiment. Um, another interesting thing that we learned um, through all this is that um, taking pictures of butterflies is really hard. Um, on the left here, we've got a picture. I'm trying to, to hold this butterfly um, and hold it still without kind of hurting it because they're super fragile to be able to take a picture. And, and this happens so many times is that the butterfly started to get away and you had to kind of just let it go and you get this blurry picture of a butterfly um, because it's it's really um, kind of, you really don't want to hurt these butterflies. And on the right, um, we have this picture of a, a California tortoiseshell, which is one of these really beautiful butterflies. And you can kind of see how we basically hold the butterfly um, in our, our hands and then we put it on just the very tips of our fingers and then we take this, these really thin pair of tweezers and we really gently slide the tweezers in between the butterfly's wings. And one of the ways you can tell a butterfly is when they're resting, their wings are up. Um, moths tend to rest with their wings down. So we have to kind of gently separate these butterfly wings um, with tweezers and, and hold them still enough. And, and these butterflies are, are pretty scared at this point. They're trying to flap their wings and so that was another really um, interesting part of this was trying to, to hold these butterflies um, still and take good pictures without hurting them. And, and they were really strong. A couple of the pictures I have of some of these bigger butterflies, 
um, their, their wings were pretty strong and you could feel them kind of pushing against your fingers and trying to get away. Um, and so the, uh, um, all that was, was pretty neat. And so now I want to talk a little bit um, about some of the, the data that we found. Um, and we're, they're still kind of collecting data and we're in the early phases. And so um, it'll look a little bit different from some of the data that you've seen before in these presentations. And so um, what we're trying to do is to figure out when do different types of flowers bloom? Um, and so on the, on the first column coming down, we've got a bunch of the common types of um, flowers that we have in the areas that I was doing. And then um, just based on my observations, I kind of put this diagram together to give you a sense on how some of these flowers bloom earlier than others. And one of the neat things that I saw was this mountain mint was actually um, one of the only plants that was around and flowering that we would see butterflies going to in the late season, the August and September. And so it seemed like a lot of butterflies, that was their only source of nectar um, around. And then what we wanna do is now that we know when the different plants um, are blooming, we kind of put this butterfly migration on there. And we say, this is when the butterfly um, migration happens. And, and these are the plants that the butterflies are eating. Um, and so this is kind of all just to collect the baseline because remember, we're studying these butterflies in wilderness areas because we really know very, very little about this. There, there hasn't been a study that's ever tried to describe when butterflies migrate or even really when flowers bloom in wilderness areas across the Western United States. And so there's a, a huge amount we don't know. Um, and the first step is just trying to figure out um, what, what's going on, what are the patterns that we see here. Um, before we go on to that. And so that's been the first couple years of data collection where we are now. And now um, what we're doing is we're in this phase where we're thinking about the future. Um, this isn't what has happened yet. This is what we're looking for. And so people are continuing to collect data to try and understand um, what's going on here. And so we're looking for scenarios like this where maybe the flowers start to bloom earlier before the butterflies migrate. And there might be fewer um, flowering plants that the butterflies could eat during their migration. And so that's something that scientists and people who study butterflies and kind of climate policy and understanding how the environment might adapt to climate change are trying to, to look at and understand. Um, another thing that could happen that we might see in our data um, is we could see that maybe the butterflies start to migrate sooner to match the flowers. Um, we don't know, but by having the baseline data that we've collected over the past couple years, um, if and when things do change, um, we can see um, all of that. And so that's kind of the, the status of the data because we don't have a ton of historic data to look at. Um, we kind of collected this baseline and, and we're waiting and continuing to collect data to see what might be changing. Um, but I do want to share a couple neat things um, that we found, I found um, through this project as we, as we start to wrap things up. Um, so here um, is kind of the, the summary um, from one of the years of data collection. You can see all these different five states across the, the Western United States. Um, we actually found a, a decent number of species and different plants, and each one of those um, uh, states have 15 to 20 different sites where people collected data at multiple times a year, looking at these species. And, and one of the interesting things with data collection was um, we collected data later in the year in September and sometimes even October. Um, and it wasn't as exciting because there weren't that many butterflies, but that was a really helpful data point to do because it, you not only want to know when the butterflies are there and when the flowers are there, but um, an important part of this is knowing when the butterflies aren't there. Um, and so sometimes we would um, put all our stuff, our butterfly nets on our backpacks and, and run out for a few hours to try and catch butterflies and, and not find any. And it was a little disappointing to myself at first, but I kind of realized that this sometimes zero data was really important in there. Um, and we also got to see a couple really cool things. And this next slide was probably one of the, the most interesting things I saw on this presentation. And it's a video. Um, of, it's actually a moth, it, it looks like a butterfly, but 
it's a moth, and this is a, a sheep moth um, is the name of it. And when we caught it, it did this really cool behavior um, that you can, I can have you try and guess what's going on here. So if we take a look at this, this moth is being held and it's wiggling its tail in the air. And I'll play that one more time. If any of you have a guess as to like what this moth is trying to do and, and why is it wiggling its tail like that? Um, or what else does this look like? Um, you can uh, try and think on that. And what we guessed, and I talked to a couple other um, scientists who study moths more in depth and know more about them than I did, was it, if you think this little abdomen looks familiar, it kind of looks like a, a yellow jacket or a, a wasp. And sometimes when wasps are threatened, they'll pulse and move um, their, their rear end and their, their stinger there to kind of warn people off. And that's why they have these bright colorations. And I think this moth was trying to mimic uh, a wasp or yellow jacket. Uh, and we kind of just caught this uh, moth on a whim because we thought it was a butterfly. Um, and when we held it to take a picture, um, we kind of saw this really cool behavior. And that's kind of, what, for me, one of the, the more interesting parts of this data collection is I got to know the butterflies and the flowers um, and even some of these moths really well by going back and visiting them multiple times a summer for several years. And so for those of you at home trying to think about what are the, the next steps of this presentation um, is basically they're going to keep collecting data and watching for changes. And as they see changes or, or not changes, they're going to inform the land managers. And so people who might be um, working in the forest management or, or people who might make decisions on how wilderness areas or, or forest service lands and other public lands are, are being used and, manager, uh, and managed to, to keep the health of the butterfly um, and the flowers in mind for that. Because Butterflies are really important to all of us, not because just because they um, are really fun and pretty to look at, but also for their pollination that they do. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to share the link um, for this group, adventurescientists.org, um, that kind of coordinated and set myself up with this research project. They have all sorts of neat volunteer projects. Um, and one of the things that's a little different about them is many of them are, are way out there. They, they look for people who are willing to go a little bit further out into nature to collect data and help scientists get hard to find pieces of data. And so for any of you watching at home who might be interested in, in volunteering for them, I had a great experience. I would recommend looking at their, their website and seeing some of their current projects in there for that. Um, and with that, that is everything I have today. Um, any of you watching at home, you're welcome to ask me some questions, um, and I'd love to, to share more about this project with you. Great. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah. I love looking at the patterns on the butterflies. They're so beautiful. That is great. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, I it, this project is really fascinating because the, there's so many different facets. And so while you're studying butterflies, you're also looking at what's happening to plants and how they're changing over time. So you mentioned that you were studying the butterfly component. Can you talk about who's studying the plants and how we're determining what, when those blooms are changing? Yeah, um, and so that's that's interesting. So there, there are a bunch of scientists at that University of Arizona entomology department who are looking at this data. So it's, it's not just one scientist looking at butterflies, it's probably a whole lab of people. And then this data is also um, pretty publicly available. You can um, contact adventure scientists who can put you in touch um, with the data there. And so um, part of this is collecting data and sharing out with, with anyone who's interested there. Um, and so that that's kind of, there, there are probably multiple studies that are coming out of this, um, multiple scientific papers who might be looking at this data and the, the kind of the, the crown jewel, I guess, is the connection of the butterflies to the flowers, but there's a lot of other research looking at the changes in both there from a whole bunch of science, uh, scientists. Interesting, it totally epitomizes the concept of citizen science. Yeah. Take all these different little bits of information and turn them into all kinds of different projects. Yeah. It reminded me, if you are watching and you're curious about citizen science, that we also have a talk by Mary Ellen Hannibal, 
wonderful author who has studied butterflies and the concepts concept of citizen science. So if that's interesting to you, we can put that in the comments below. I was reminded of that as Spencer was talking. So um, another fascinating thing I wanted to ask you about was the concept of studying things that only exist in a really remote area. Mm -hmm. In this case, you were fortunate because you're a runner. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how scientists access things in super remote areas that are maybe hard to get to? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, not, I've done this a little bit myself and then I have a bunch of friends who do it. And um, for whatever reason, uh, maybe, uh, but a lot of the scientists that I talk to, this is maybe one of their, their favorite thing, um, favorite part of some of the sciences they do. And it's kind of like a, a, a camping trip, I think. Myself was a little bit of the exception, and I was able to go run run out this place and then run back in the same day. And it, it took a while. It was probably an, an eight-hour day. Um, a lot of people and other people who worked on this project will, will do it as a camping trip, and they'll they'll walk out. They'll they'll bring their camping stuff like you would um, go backpacking and camping like any of us might do. Uh, but they'll also bring their science equipment, and they might hike out one day and, and spend a few days um, in their field site kind of collecting data um, and, and doing all this along the way. And so it's um, it, it's pretty neat and fun, but you do have to kind of think about safety um, a little bit more. Um, the video of uh, my friend catching the butterfly is, is pretty rocky terrain. And you're having to basically chase after these butterflies almost as fast as you can. And um, you kind of have to, we brought a fair amount of first aid stuff and, and tried to make sure that we were, we were keeping, keeping things in a, in a reasonable risk tolerance. Like, if we we rolled an ankle or, or twisted something way out there, it would it would be um, a pain. And there, there's not cell phone reception, and so we bring these little emergency beacons to kind of let people know where we are. And um, there there are a few extra details. It's not a a short walk from something or in a in a lab, but um, I think a lot of people really like it because you not only get to do the science, but um, because you're you're camping out there, you also get to to spend some really neat time. Um, in these special places that not everyone gets to, or not that many people get to spend time in. Right. I think when we talk with lab scientists, sometimes they really miss the part of their academic studies when they got to do field research. Yeah. And so it really brings in this outdoor component. Yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> I had an yeah. awesome time. So Jack, hi Jack, how are you? He's one of our board members. He wants to know how many butterfly species have you seen and or caught in the Tahoe area specifically? Yeah, um, and so I don't necessarily know if I have an exact count from that. I think on average, um, during kind of the middle of the summer when we would go out to our field sites, we would probably find um, eight to 10 species of butterflies um, out, of, out of sight, um, kind of less so in September, October. This is the, I would probably guess in the, the range of, of 14 to 15 species of butterflies that I, I personally caught in the Tahoe area over, over doing this for a few years. And um, I've also seen a lot more than I've caught. <laughs> um, and so I guess probably the, the number of species would be um, a few more than that of, of things I've seen. Um, and sometimes with some of these rare butterflies, and um, there were a few that I, I saw a couple times and I, I chased after and tried to catch, but um, I couldn't actually get in, in my net there. And then I probably saw at least 10 times as many butterflies as I caught. Um, and so that was it. And another interesting thing is that there, there are some butterflies that were, were really, really abundant. Um, some of the, there's some swallowtails, there are the California tortoiseshells, um, and then these little silvery blue butterflies that, we caught many, many each time at each field site. And then there were a couple others that were that were rare that we might be lucky to catch one each time. And so it was kind of neat not only to see the, the diversity, but also the, the distribution in that some butterflies are a lot more common than others. And sometimes that changes throughout the year. Mm, interesting. So when you were first talking about the characteristics of butterflies, you were talking about the migration patterns. Yeah. And I'm wondering, do scientists know why monarchs migrate twice? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure exactly um, the mechanism for that. I'm sure some other people would would know and be able to, to share that. Um, I think part of it is the, the timing of their life cycle um, and that 
Um, other butterflies are, are more able to overwinter as, um, as eggs or, or larvae, um, where monarch butterflies, wherever they have um, evolved, don't do that. They tend to migrate someplace um, when it's warmer here in the summer of the Northern Hemisphere and, and then go back rather than to, to not have the same individual do that. And so my guess is it's a, it's a strategy that allows them to, to maximize their ability to um, to get the food they want it and reproduce that way. Um, but I, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And then the butterflies that don't migrate at all, I wondered if those are specific to warmer climates? Yeah, for the most part, the butterflies that, that don't migrate are tend to live in warmer places. Um, but there, there are some exceptions to that. And then the butterflies that live in colder places that don't migrate tend to be really good at surviving colder winters um, without uh, um, in the egg or, or larvae stage. Um, and so it's kind of different ways butterflies adapt to find these places. And so you can imagine if you're really good at spending the winter in a cold place as a butterfly, um, that could save you a lot of energy because migrating is, is costly. And when, you're, when your offspring wake up, they're right next to the, the food that they want to be next to in the place they want to be. They don't have to fly for hundreds of miles to do that. Um, and so kind of just different strategies that different types of butterflies have to try and be successful and, and reproduce and have more offspring and stay alive. Mm -hmm. So from your studies, I'm wondering if you have come across a favorite butterfly. Yeah, um, the the, Calif the California tortoiseshell that I, I shared a picture of is, is definitely one of the prettier ones. Um, it's also pretty partial to the, the, the swallowtails. Um, they're kind of the, the big biggest butterflies we would catch. Um, they're mostly black with some yellow spots in there. And those are really powerful when you're holding them. You kind of have to hold, hold relatively tight because they're, they're beating their wings and they have a, a, lot, of, a lot of ones. Um, but there, there are a couple, probably my single favorite was the, um, there's this orange sulfur. It was this really orangey um, butterfly. I think it's actually the California state butterfly. Um, it's just a, a really neat kind of bright orange color. And they were pretty rare. We only saw one or two of them um, during this time. And, and so that was uh, probably the highlight. Neat. Being out there in the field and getting to see things you wouldn't ordinarily see is really special. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we're going to wrap up soon. Just a couple more questions. Um, there's one here from Jack, which I think is great because it kind of wraps up the research. Um, so he's asking, has the research group created a checklist of species in the in the different research areas by time of year? Yeah, so like what types of, of butterflies do we expect or normally see in, say, July or, say, June in, in different places? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I think part of it is that um, this project's only been going on for three years. And so right now that, that checklist is still kind of in a, a spreadsheet form um, where we have the, the abundance and, and those things. And I think um, because of uh, the, the kind of youngness of the research, they're still working on kind of collecting more data and figuring out when, when the variability would be. I think another thing that is a little tricky is some of these areas is are fairly mountainous and we see big gradients in phenology just with elevation and so like some of the places i collected data at were at 8000 feet um where other some of the other places in california were at four or five thousand feet um and so that adds a little bit of, of noise in that and so it's maybe hard to say um maybe we might have the california tortoise shell in in june at four thousand feet um but at um, August at 8,000 feet. I think because of that is um, that spatial variation and variation with geography um, is partly why they're they're waiting to collect more data before putting out something um, like Jack suggested here is, is that I think it's, it's coming just more data is needed. Mm -hmm. Well it'd be interesting to see the way the project develops. Yeah no it's, it's pretty neat um, and I would encourage anyone to, to check out those projects and and find some of the other stuff like that because collecting data can be a little tedious, but you also get to know a, an area or a type of species or an organism a lot better than you might otherwise. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, I think we are going to wrap up here. 
So Spencer, thank you so much for okay. joining us. It's great to have you talk about something a little bit different than our programs, which are wonderful as well, but your own research is great too. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you are curious about the other talk that we mentioned, we'll put that in the comments. Jack also commented a great resource here. Uh, it's called the Handbook, Handbook of Citizen Science and Conservation and Ecology. So that'll be down in the comments if you wanna learn more about how to do citizen science. As Spencer mentioned, you can download the iNaturalist app for free on uh, whatever platform you get your apps. And I hope you have a great day, Spencer. All right, thank you too. Okay, bye.